onto the sermon. So if you go back to Proverbs chapter 4, you might want to stay there for a little while. Or if you've already closed it, it's okay. We're going to be looking at some other passages anyway. But um, I'm going to be preaching on the topic of homeschooling. Okay? So I know not everybody could make it last week, uh, but we watched a documentary on homeschooling. And uh, I don't know, I found, I found it pretty profitable. I hope you guys did as well. And um, we're going back to the series on, uh, uh, on family. Okay? I had, we had gone through a series on family. I took a short break. We're now back into it. And it's good that that documentary came out at the right time because I did want to preach on homeschooling, okay? But there are some thoughts that I want to give you besides what was found in that documentary, all right? So the title of the sermon tonight is Homeschooling is Biblical. Homeschooling is Biblical, all right? Now, first of all, wow, it's going to be challenging with the rain. Huh? Sit closer, all right? Don't worry, Matt, Matt can turn up the volume for me, so. I'll give you guys a minute, all right. Hopefully the Lord pulls back the rain soon. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? All right. Now, we're in Proverbs chapter 4, okay? So, we're, clearly, we're seeing a father instructing his son, okay? Now, when it comes to homeschooling, it's a bit of a weird topic in this day and age, okay? If you're homeschooling your children, if you're not taking your children to the standard school system, people look at you as though you're weird, okay? It's not normal this day and age to teach your children at home, okay? But let me just say to you that hundreds of years ago, going back just a hundred years ago, it was perfectly normal. In fact, what was abnormal was putting your children in a school institution. That was abnormal, all right? So the first thing I want to cover tonight is who is supposed to teach your children? Who is supposed to teach your children? Keep your finger there in Proverbs chapter 4 and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Is my voice coming through the speakers? Yeah? All right, awesome. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. The Bible says, And ye, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Look, if all you had was the Bible, okay, you did not know about any kind of school systems out there, you didn't know about TAFE or university, all you had with you was the Bible to start off with, and you read the Bible, who do you think you would conclude is responsible for teaching your children? You would conclude it's the parents, right? You would conclude that if you just didn't have this world system, you know, uh, uh, pushing its agenda upon you, okay? The first thing I just want to show you, and I can show you uh, many, many passages, but it's the parents' responsibility to train their children, okay? Now, when it comes to training or teaching your children, don't have in your minds, oh, mathematics, oh, English and grammar, oh, science. Look, teaching your children is more than just a subject. It, it includes teaching your ki kids these things, but it also includes teaching the Bible, teaching the way of the Lord. It includes teaching them finances, teaching them about money, okay, and the value of money, what, you know, to be responsible with money. It's about teaching your children to be polite, to say thank you, to say please, teach them good morals, teach them good principles, Teaching your children is more than just a textbook, is what I'm trying to say, okay? But it includes the textbook. It includes uh, the subjects that they need to know that helps exercise their minds, and especially for our sons, gets them ready for the workplace in the future, okay? Now, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. 
because our church, thank God, is made up of homeschooling mothers. So I'm not offending anybody, right? Now, obviously, if I had mothers here that were putting their kids in the public school system, or even in a Christian school, this sermon might be a little bit offensive to them, okay? But thank God, that's not something I have to worry about right now. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Now, the reason I brought up the mothers here is because, generally speaking, dad goes out of the house and works a job. They're not there with their children, but mom surely is. And for most homeschooling families, it's the mother who is instructing their children, okay? But before I go on to the mothers, I just want to reinforce who is the head of the wife and who is accountable for the family God has put you in. It's dad, it's, it's the husband, it's the father, okay? Look at Ephesians 6, 4. The Bible says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Hey, is it just mom's job to train the kids? No, it's dad's job as well. Okay? And if you just go in the previous chapter, Ephesians 5.23, Ephesians 5.23, we already covered this before, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Okay, so just to reinforce dads, husbands, fathers, you are accountable for your family and your children's education falls upon your shoulders. Now, you may not be the one doing it day in, day out, but you're accountable. God holds you accountable that your children don't grow up to be, I was going to say bogans, but that's probably not the right word. I don't know. They, they, they learn, okay? They're educated. They have wisdom. They have knowledge. Okay, it falls on dad's shoulders. Okay, it's the fathers that are accountable to make sure their children get an education, get wisdom, get learning. I'm going to read to you from Joel chapter one, verse two. You don't need to turn there. It says, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land, have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers. Tell it your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Dads, you need to make sure instruction is passed down to your children and that they know they're responsible to pass down that same instruction, maybe even better instruction, onto their children generation after generation. And as we saw in Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, as we read that, I don't know if your finger's still in there, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 1, it said, Here ye children... The instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Hey, who's teaching the children here? It's the father, right? The father is passing on instruction. And then in verse 3, he says, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. So do you see the father teaches his kids, but he says, hey, my dad taught me as well. Okay, so we see the biblical principle here. We see the, the framework of teaching is it comes from the parents and the father included. Okay, the father is accountable for these things. And even when God uh, lifts up and endorses Abraham, he says about Abraham, uh, this is Jesus speaking to the angels in Genesis 18, 19. He says, for I know him, speaking of Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he have spoken of him. So God knew Abraham will play a, a role in instructing, in guiding, in teaching, in commanding his children. Okay, so please, uh, fathers, as homeschooling fathers, please don't get the mindset that, well, that's just my wife's responsibility. It is your wife's responsibility, okay? But you also play an important role. You're accountable. You're head of the family. And if it's not being done well, hey, God's going to be knocking on you and saying, hey, what's going on? Okay, not on the wife, not on the mother, but on you as the, as the head of your home, all right? Now, let me talk about accountability versus responsibility. Okay, accountability versus responsibility. 
Now, at the end of the day, we, we, uh, this is why a few months ago I covered the, the teaching on the different institutions that God has ordained, you know, the family, the church, government, and the workplace. Is because at the end of the day, there's always someone that is accountable. There is always someone that calls the shots and is the head. Okay? And when we talk about accountability, it doesn't mean this person does not have responsibility. Of course he does. But at the end of the day, it falls on their shoulders. Okay? They're the ones that have to answer for success or for failure. Okay? But of course, when you've got an institution, the one that's the head, the one that's accountable, will pass on, will delegate responsibility unto others. Okay? So, of course, when we talk about a homeschooling family, dad has to go to work, right? He's working at least eight hours, maybe nine, 10, 11, 12 hours, depends on the kind of job that you're doing. And you leave mom in charge of raising the kids. You say to your wife, honey, you know, you need to teach the kids. You know, if you have any problems, please ask me. If you need any help, you know, I'm the one that's accountable. But at the end of the day, I'm holding you responsible for training the children. Okay, so more often than not, in most homeschooling families, mum carries that responsibility. Okay, but never forget it's dads that um, are, are accountable. You know, Proverbs chapter one verse eight says, "My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother." Both father and mother are given instructions to their children. Okay, it's a twofold process there, and. Uh, of course, once that responsibility has been delegated down to your wife, to mum, to train the children, you know, we see this in the scriptures as well. You know, I won't get you to turn there. I might get you guys to turn to, um, let me give you a passage to turn to. Were well, you guys in Proverbs? So go to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. But I'll just read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul speaking to Timothy, who was a pastor at the time. He says to Timothy, and that from a child... Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we see Paul saying, Timothy, wow, Timothy, you from a child, you've known the holy scriptures, right? How? How did he know those scriptures from a child? Because in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Do you see how mum passed on the instruction? Mum uh, filled little Timothy with the knowledge of the scriptures, and grandma L Lois as well, all right? And he increased in faith from a child, okay? And this is eventually what led him to be a successful pastor, you know, a great man of God in the early stages of the New Testament church. You guys are in Proverbs 31, just verse 1. I know we've looked at these passages before, but I just want to cover these again. Proverbs 31, verse 1, the Bible says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Hey, King Lemuel, who's that? That's King Solomon. Who's the wisest man that we read about, besides Jesus Christ, of course, in the Bible? It's King Solomon. He was the wisest man that you read about in the Bible. His wisdom came from God directly. But notice that even mom was able to give him wisdom and was recorded in the scriptures. Mums and dads, you're both responsible for raising your children. Mum obviously is going to spend more hours with the kids during the day. And dads, don't forget you're accountable. All right? If your kids aren't getting instruction, you need to ask your wife what's going on. Okay? Why, why are you dropping in this area? Why aren't they being taught? You know, why aren't they uh, are learning things? Okay? Now... I'm all for homeschooling. You guys know this. We have 10 kids. Is it six kids that we homeschool now? I don't know. Six, six kids now. Um, it, it's hard work. Okay? It's not so difficult with one or two. Once you get to six, it becomes really difficult, not because of the number of kids, but they're all at different grades as well. Right? It's all over the place. So there's, there's definitely a challenge there. Okay? Now, I'm all for homeschooling parents. And I've met some really wonderful homeschooling parents. And I've also met some very hypocritical homeschooling parents. Okay, there are uh, there are there is hypo uh, hypocrisy with some homeschooling parents, and I want to cover this a little bit today. All right. So the thing that irks me the most with believers, with Christians, is when they're hypocritical. And look, I'm sometimes hypocritical because I'm a fallen man. 
you know, I don't, you know, always, you know, do things 100% correct all the time, okay? But, um, you know, Jesus Christ hated hypocrisy as well. You know, when, he's, when, when Jesus Christ spoke of the Pharisees, he warned his disciples, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What was, what was the leaven of the Pharisees? He goes, which is hypocrisy. Which is hypocrisy. The, the Pharisees were known for their hypocritical attitude. They'd say one thing and do another. They'd put expectations on one person and wouldn't themselves fulfill those expectations. Okay? And criticize others for not keeping uh, the laws of God. And, and they, they failed in many, many areas of life. Now, when it comes to homeschooling, it's righteous. Okay? It's a good work. Okay, and when you're doing it, praise God that you have the ability, uh, and, and you, you know you've you, you obeyed God. You're taking on that role. You're taking accountability. You're taking responsibility for raising your children. Okay, but here's where the prideful attitude sometimes, you know, with something that is righteous, and you're full of zeal for that for that righteousness, but sometimes pride can eat you up, right? And you're the homeschooling parent. You're raising your kids. And yet there's another family in the church or there's a family friend of yours that aren't homeschooling. All right. And then the pride comes in. Right. And, and they'll say things like, you know, I, I would never, I would never allow my kids to be trained by anyone else. You know, and it's like, you know, you're telling that to the parents that put their kids in a public school system where they've got probably another like eight teachers teaching them or something like that. Right. And um, look, first of all, it's not your business. Okay, every institution, God has put a head above that institution. Okay, for you to be critical to other families, that's not your place. Hey, criticize your own family. You know, judge yourselves and do better yourselves. Okay, and what I find when, when believers are criticizing other families, it's because there are insecurities in their own families. Okay, and they're projecting that onto others. Hey, if you're homeschooling your kids... Praise God! Rejoice in that! You don't have to spend your time criticizing those that are not to make you feel better. Okay? And look, I'm all for homeschooling. Don't, don't misunderstand that. Okay? I'm all for it. Uh, but be careful of this because the same homeschooling parents that say, oh, I'll never put my kids, you know, I'll never allow others to train my kids, they're putting their kids in the piano lessons and they've got a piano instructor. All right? They're putting their kids in the... I don't know, the swimming lessons, taking them to the swimming pool. They've got a swimming instructor teaching them how to swim. Yeah. And then their kids grow up. They're the same parents putting their kids in an apprenticeship, right, to learn. Let's say an electrician. You know, they'll, they'll go to, a, they'll, they'll get a, a, a job with an electrician and they're training your kids electrical work. Look, it's happening all the time. You bring your kids to church. Who's teaching your kids? The pastor, right? The preacher. Look, there's nothing wrong, and I'm saying be mindful of this, because I'm all for homeschooling, but I'm also against hypocrisy, okay? So we need to make sure, look, I, I don't believe there's anything wrong with having other people train your children, okay? That, that might sound weird, but let, let me go into it, okay? Because I've, we've done this. Like, let's say, I mean, we don't, we don't need this, but let's say uh, Christina, let's say with the high school kids who are doing mathematics, it gets a bit complicated and Christina can't keep up with that work because of the amount of kids we have. Would there be anything wrong with getting a math tutor, do you think? Bringing them to the house and training your kids in mathematics? I mean, nothing wrong with that, nothing sinful, right? What if we've got some older kids, Isabel's 13, Nicholas is 12, and Christina's busy that day, and Christina says to Nicholas, can you please help Jonathan? Can you help Jonathan do this page in, you know, because obviously he's older, and he'll know that, we'll be able to teach him easily. Was there anything wrong or sinful about getting our own older kids to teach our younger kids? No. Okay? So, I'm just trying to show you, hey, we need to be careful of hypocrisy. Hey, we've taken our kids to a piano teacher where they've been able to learn piano. Did we commit sin doing that? Were we wrong in doing that? No. We've taken our kids to, like I said, swimming lessons. You know, my kids, because we don't have a big backyard in our house, to get a bit of exercise, a bit of physical, uh, you know, strength. We took them and they got some soccer training, right? We had, they had a coach teaching them soccer. Was that, was that wrong? Did we commit sin by doing that? 
No, but do you notice there, you know, and like I said, one day I would hope my kids would get an apprenticeship, a trainership, and get training on the job and learn some other skills and other tasks. Hey, listen, let's not be hypocr hypo hypocritical, all right? Let's make sure we, we keep in mind what it is that is actually wrong about the school system. It's not that somebody else is teaching your kids because you can allow other people to teach your kids and still be in control of it. Still be in control of it. And that is the problem with the public school system. We'll go into that a bit later on, okay? But I want you to think about this. You know, we do have even a, a biblical uh, principle in this. Remember the story of Hannah? Remember Hannah was barren and couldn't have children? And she prays to the Lord and says, look, if you give me a man-child, if you give me a son, then I'll, I'll commit him to you. You know, and she does. God blesses her. She falls pregnant, has Samuel. And then after Samuel is weaned as a little baby, he's given to uh, Eli. He was the high priest of the tabernacle. There was no temple at the time, but at the tabernacle. And Eli, the high priest, raised Samuel, taught Samuel, trained Samuel, and Samuel became a prophet of the Lord. Okay, so we see that even in the Bible, it's not sinful in of itself to have other people train your children. All right. Now, let's, let's think about these concepts. There's nothing wrong with a tutor, mathematics. Let's say we've got a science guy's world to come and teach. And then, you know, we needed the, you know, the, the I don't know, sports. You know, needed to add a bit of sports. Let's say uh, we wanted to teach, you know, our, you know, our daughters a bit of sewing, a bit of knitting. And we've got someone that's skilled to do that. Just, just think this through with me, right? And, then, and so you're, you're traveling throughout the week, taking into these little different activities for them to do and to learn. But how much easier would it be if they were all in one place? In one building, right? We had the math tutor there, the science tutor. We added stuff there. We started adding, you know, maybe someone that can teach them computers and IT. Someone that can teach them, you know, uh, geography and history. All in one place, you know? all together. I just, I just want you to think about this. I'm not saying this is good. I'm just, just think about it, right? Put them all together in one place and it's easier. Instead of you having to travel here, there, there, throughout the week, you take them to the one building and then we call that public school. Now, so hold on. So was it, where has, where's the problem now? Is there, is there really a problem? I mean, hypothetically, is it sinful? Is what I'm going to try to make you think about, hypothetically. No, it's not, okay? Hypothetically, there's nothing wrong with putting your child in a building with teachers and they're learning things, right? Because you do that anyway. It's just that you don't do it in the one building. You don't do it in the one location. So what is actually wrong with schooling, like the, your, your school system? I'm against the school system, by the way. I just make that clear. But I just want you to think about it. What is it? Because I don't want to be a hypocritical parent. You know, I want to make sure... That's what Jesus Christ hates, and I just want you to think about this and increase in wisdom a little bit, okay? Now, theoretically, there's nothing wrong with the school system, but once you put that theory into practice, then it goes wrong, all right? Some things in theory sound good, but as soon as it's into practice, it, it collapses and falls apart, okay? So practically speaking, look, ultimately, let me explain to you what the problem with the school system is. Who's accountable Who's responsible for training the kids? Moms and dads, right? You have control over the tutor. You don't like the tutor, you kick him out, you get someone else so you don't deal with it, right? You have a problem with the piano teacher. They're, they're lazy, they're sloppy, they're not doing a good job. You get them, yeah, okay, we'll, go, we'll, go, we'll get someone else. Parents are still in the control of that environment, okay? But when you put them in the school system, parents lose control they lose accountability of the training, they lose responsibility, and this is the problem with the school system. This is the problem with the school system because it takes away the accountability that God has given the parents. Okay? So, just mentally, and you see this, you guys know this, I've seen this, parents that put their kids in school, don't you just forget about them? I mean, I haven't done this to my kids, but you'd forget about them for those six, seven, eight hours, whatever long it is that they're in school. And you go about your business. And you're not so concerned about what they're learning on that day because you've handed over that accountability onto the teachers. All right? And uh, I see this 
you know, I'm, I'm not in a full-time work scenario anymore. But I used to see this with parents during school holidays. And then when the school holidays were wrapping up, they were like, oh man, I can't wait for school to start again. Why? Because you want your kids to be educated? No, because they want the kids out of their hands. Okay? It, it, it promotes, um, I don't know, it, it promotes thinking of your kids as a hassle, as a burden. I can't wait for them to go once again so I can have my freedom. I can have my free time. Do you see how once you start changing the accountability and responsibility that God has laid out, it starts causing problems. It starts causing strain in the family. Okay? And kids are seen as a burden. You have no control over who teaches your children. At least with the tutor, as I said, at least with the swimming instruction, the piano teacher, whatever, you can swap and change or stop the program whenever you want. But once you put him in the school system, you can't kick out the teacher. You haven't got that say. You haven't got that say, all right? And you have not only, you have no control over the, um, the teacher, you have no control over what your kids are being taught. You have no control over it. At least if I take them to a sewing class, I know they're learning sewing at that point in time, all right? But you put them in a sewing class in the school, they could be learning about, I don't know, um, transsexual stuff. Who knows, right? Who knows what that teacher could be instructing them, okay? Just lunacy, right? Lunacy. You, you don't have control over it. And then, you know, if you think, ah, oh, and this is the other thing. You're not warned when they're taught wickedness. You just find out once your kid has been taught those wicked things and then they come home and tell you, then you find out. And then it's too late because it's already been taught to your children. All right? And then if you want to complain about it, you know, who would you complain about? Like, who, who would you go to if, you're, if you, your child's in school and the teacher's taught him some stupid, wicked, unbiblical, ungodly stuff? You think you could complain to the teacher. You, could, you think you could go to the teacher and say, well, I don't want you teaching this to my kids. What's the teacher going to say? Well, it's not my decision. You know, that's the decision of the school board. It's the school board that has agreed to cover these things. All, all I'm doing is teaching it. And so you go to the school board, and you go to the school board and say, look, this is not good to be teaching our children. And the school board will say, well, it, you know, uh, we don't have a choice in this. This comes from the Department of Education. You know, it's come from the state government, Department of Education. And uh, to be accredited as a, church, as, a, as a school, we need to follow through the program that they've given us. And so, okay, well, who do you complain to now? I mean, as soon as you get to the government level, now you're dealing with a faceless personality. I mean, you don't know who you're dealing with now, okay? And you're trying to voice your opinion. Do you think they're concerned about a couple of parents complaining? They've got millions of kids throughout their schools, and your voice is what? Your voice is like drop in the ocean. Listen, when you're homeschooling your kids, your voice, your opinion, is all that matters. You want to change the curriculum? You want to rip out that page? You want to skip that chapter and move on? Do it, okay? You have control. You have accountability. You're responsible. But when they're in the school system, you lose it all. Okay? And you're, you're just a, your voice is a drop in the ocean, guys. This is the problem with the school system. Not so much someone else teaching your kids something. It's, it takes away. It takes all that away that God has given you. And it's a blessing. You know, it's power. It's control that God has given you over your children. So you can raise them to be a faithful generation. And so my point is, guys, the core and fundamental reason the school system is unbiblical and wicked is because parents are stripped of accountability, responsibility, and control of training their children. All right? Let alone, and I, I didn't have time to cover this stuff, but let alone the peer pressure, you know, let alone the drugs and the, the fornication that goes on in the schools, let alone the atheistic evolutionary uh, false sciences that are being taught in the schools, let alone the abuse and the bullying that some kids go through, you know, let alone the stupid fads that kids think they have to keep up with in order to remain cool, you know, you know, the fidget spinner, sorry, no. <laughs> it, my, my kids had fidget spinners, uh, let alone the rejection that kids go through when there's a fight and all their kids, all their friends, you know, turn their backs against them and they feel rejected with no one there to turn to. Hey, look, we don't even have time to cover that stuff, but, you know, and, and that is bad. That, those, are, those are plenty of reasons 
for you not to send your kids to school. But I just want to give you that, that biblical reason because you lose accountability. You lose responsibility. You lose control of your children. And the Bible says in Psalm 1, 1, you know, guys, know this, we covered this before. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Hey, and who's passing down the curriculum into the schools? It's the ungodly. You know, you got your kids in school. They learn the counsel of the ungodly. It says, no standeth in this way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hey, when you're homeschooling your kids, your kids have the luxury to meditate on the word of God day and night, don't they? Public school system, they want, you won't be allowed to read your Bibles there. You know, and so, uh, oh, and also Jeremiah 10, 10 2, uh, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. Hey, when you put your kids in the school system, what are you doing? You're teaching them the way of the heathen. And God says to his people, don't teach them that way. Okay, because. God, God warns Israel over and over again. You know, don't learn the, the, the gods of the heathen. Don't, and, and why? Because he says, because I'm your Lord. You know, I'm jealous. You, you know, you're to worship me. And they disobey. They learn the way of the heathen. They w- learn the way of the ungodly nations. And then they start following after false gods. All right? Bringing damnation upon themselves. So you might say, well, hold on. Then if, you, if you're not against Kevin, if you're not against... People teaching your kids, but you're against the school system because it's, you know, it's ungodly. You know, it's got curriculum of the heathen. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. I have a solution. What about the Christian school? Right? What about the Christian school? Because that way we can make sure that believers, that people that at least fear the Lord, that are teaching the kids. You know, instead of the heathen taking control, we can do it better. Well, first of all, the Bible just said, don't learn the way of the heathen. Right? The school system is the way of the heathen. Why would you take that system and Christianize it? It already fails in the world. Why do you think it's going to work and calling it Christian? All right. Uh, so that's number one. You're doing it the heathen way. Number two, in order for Christian schools, and I'm just talking about Australia here, okay? because I, I went to a Christian high school. Um, in order for Christian schools to, to be accredited, okay, for them to get their financial kickbacks from the government, what do they need to do? They're still under, you know, the, the Department of Education. They're still under the ungodly Department of Education, and they're still required to teach things that they know are, is unbiblical and ungodly. I was in Christian school, okay, I think I was year 8 or year 9, when, and uh, there was a big commotion with the parents and the teachers. Anyway, the school decided to teach evolution, atheism and evolution in the Christian school. And the parents up in arms about it, right? I mean, and the school's like, hey, in order for us to remain as a school, the government's telling us we've got to teach it, all right? And so in science class, we started learning about evolution, you know, all the nonsense, you know, you know anti-biblical stuff. And the teachers would teach us these things. We'd go, you know, lesson after lesson learning this nonsense. I mean, what a waste of time. I don't know how many hours we spent learning about evolution. And then at the end of it, the teacher says, but we don't believe this. What am I doing here? (laughs) It better just just let me go home. (laughs) Let me go home and do something useful and practical with my time. Okay? And that's when I was a kid. I'm assuming things are probably worse today for the Christian schools. Okay, they're still under the thumb of a heathen government. Okay, number three, you still lose accountability for your children's education. Right, you still uh, uh, hand over that responsibility to other teachers or to the school board. Okay, you're still doing that. So why would you want to have put your kids in a Christian school? And number four, all the peer pressure the drugs, the fornication, etc., etc., it's still there. All right? It's still there. And I would say to you, it's worse. It's worse. I'll tell you why it's worse. And I, I think, look, I thank God for my parents. 
They put me in a Christian school for high school. You know, I went to a public school, primary school. Then I did year seven in a public school. Then I uh, finished off my high school in a Christian school. All right. And I, I thank my parents because the Christian school was expensive. I'm not sure how much I was spending. You know, thousands, thousands on my education in the Christian school. It was a Baptist school. All right. And uh, they thought they were doing the best. They were doing the best they could for their. So I, I don't, I don't hold it. I don't, I don't hold them accountable. You know, I, I don't, I'm not angry at them for putting me in a Christian school. But look, when I found out I was going to the Christian school, I was excited. You know, I was like, all oh, right, cool. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be amongst other believers. I'm going to be amongst people that actually fear the Lord, that actually go to church and actually care about the things that I care about, right? And um, I, that's what I was looking forward to. Um, but that school produced all kinds of weirdos and homosexuals. I mean, it just seemed like homosexual after homosexual was coming out of that school. Weirdos, all right? Once the school deputy, or the deputy principal, I should say, dressed up in drag. I mean, he was dared by some, some students in the school. I think it was for fundraising or something stupid anyway, all right? And he dressed up in drag. He came in in a skirt, in fishnet net stockings, right? With makeup, with lipstick. And I was, I mean, look, I was so disgusted. Right? Thank God I was saved. Thank God I had the Holy Ghost in me saying this is wrong. Hey, but the kids in the school, do you think they were disgusted? They're like, yeah, yeah, woo! All right, that's what, look, I, I'm sure, I don't know this as a fact, but I'm sure the deputy principal in the worldly public school did not dress up in drag, right? But the Christian one did, so-called Christian. The science teacher, one of the most popular science teachers by all the students, he would have the kids come to his house and they'd watch Star Wars and all those kind of sci-fi stuff, right? He's now a tranny. He's now transsexual. He added me to Facebook a few months ago, and I, you know, of course, rejected him. I'm not, I don't want, you know, to see that filth. And he's got his lover, who's another tranny. Science teacher. Science teacher. People, someone that's trying to teach you about physics, about biology, about the universe. You'd think, out of all the people, the one that would know of the Creator more than anything is a science teacher. He's a tranny now. You know, wants to be a woman, whatever. You know? The teachers, the Christian teachers, taught all kinds of heresy. And I remember one of the teachers that I probably respected the most as a mature believer teaching that hell is not a place of fire. It's just a place of darkness and you're away from the presence of God. And that, that's hell, right? Teaching that, you know, God does not, you know, cast people into a lake of fire. Just, just heresy. And if I, if I really thought about it, I probably could come up with so many other things that were so unbiblical and so heretical. The Christian school I went to was NIV only. NIV only. Okay? I mean, you'd get in trouble if you brought any other Bible. <laughs> you'd be like, hey, you're meant to bring the NIV. That's, the, that's what's, uh, you know, uh, accepted in the school. And I could not read that piece of junk. I could not read it. I, 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 you know, as far as my Bible reading went, my understanding of the Bible, it went downhill. Because I just couldn't read it. It didn't feel like the Bible. It didn't sound like the Bible to me. Okay? I couldn't memorize verses out of the NIV. <laughs> I feel sorry for those that have memorized verses out of that book. <laughs> it was Baptist only by name, but it gradually became more Pentecostal, more Pentecostal as time went on. And the heroes of the faith of the school, the heroes, the ones the kids looked up to, were the, the Christian rock bands and the Christian bikies. You know, with the long hair and the tattoos, and they're going around riding for Jesus Christ. You know, rrr, you know they were heroes of the faith. You know, not Moses, you know, not Abraham, you know, not King David. It was these people that looked like the world. I mean, I couldn't tell them any different from the, from the heroes of the world. You know, they looked exactly the same. And like I said, all the peer pressure, the drugs, it was all there. The fornication, it was still there. And the reason why it was worse is because I, as a child, expected it to be better. You know, I knew if I went to a worldly school, a school that doesn't read the Bible, a school that doesn't fear the Lord, 
I expect them to be rebellious. I expect them to be disgusting. I expect them to be ungodly. I can accept that. That's easy, right? That's, I know the world is like that. I know they don't like the, the laws of God. That's easy to accept. But when you're told you go into a Christian school and you think, wow, I'm going to get away from this. And then the people that you thought were saved, you th- I mean, maybe they are, I don't know. But those that are, you know, fearing the Lord or whatever, and they're doing the exact same things, that really hurt me in my faith. That really hurt me because I wasn't expecting this. You know, I, it, it took me by surprise. I was shocked. You know, I wasn't shocked in the public school. You know, there was all kind of weird things going on there. But I was shocked that it was happening in the Christian school. No wonder they're producing hom- any number of homosexuals in that school. And look, I'm, I'm assuming all the Christian schools are the same across the nation. Can't just be the one I was in. <laughs> they're probably all the same. So look, guys, the Christian school idea, again, you know, theoretically, yeah, it sounds nice. Again, when you start putting these things into practice, it falls apart. Because it's not following the law of God. It's not following after the commands of God. You know, and when you start moving away from what God teaches, of course, of course it falls apart. Of course it's going to be uh, uh, ungodly and wicked and so on and so forth. Okay? So, in conclusion, guys, um, I just want to go through our personal reasons as a family why we homeschool. Now, when we started to homeschool our kids, well, when I decided to homeschool our kids, I wasn't even married. I don't think I was even engaged. I was, I, I was driving home and I was listening to uh, Talkback Radio and there was some guy from America that was uh, a former principal of a school and he was promoting homeschooling in Australia. He was doing seminars or whatever. And I started to hear about it and I was like, wow, this is awesome. You know, I didn't even think about it as a biblical principal or anything like that. I just thought, this sounds really good because I went to public school. I didn't like it. I went to Christian school. I liked it even less. I mean, I made some good friends, but besides that, I mean, education-wise, I didn't like it either, you know. Christina went to Catholic school, you know, private Catholic school as well. You know, and she didn't like the experiences she went through. And so I thought, well, you know what? We're going to give homeschooling a chance, even before we were married, before anything, before we had any kids. And so it wasn't even a biblical thing and, uh, that I really wanted to try. Uh, but if you're a homeschooling mom, you want to make a list. I really recommend you do this. You want to make a list, write it down somewhere, you know, on the computer, save it, or on your whiteboard, or on a poster on the wall, somewhere. These are the reasons why we homeschool, okay? Because homeschooling sounds wonderful, and it is, but there's also going to be hard times. There's going to be tears, there's going to be difficulties, it's going to be hard to maintain the house and, re- and teach the kids, and it's, it's going, there's, going to be, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be a newborn baby, and then it's like, well, you know, messes up the, the, the routine, and, and all these kinds of things, right? But... When it gets difficult, you're going to be tempted. What if we just put him in school? That's what's going to happen. Are you going to start thinking, what if, is it really that bad? Should I just put him in school? But if you have these reasons jotted down, you can revisit the reasons and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> right? that's why I'm homeschooling, right? And you stick to it, right? Uh, let, let me give you seven reasons why we as a family homeschool. Number one, as protection from anti-biblical philosophies. Okay, we want them to grow up knowing the word of God Knowing how God sees the world, what is right and what is wrong according to the law of God. Okay, that's number one. Number two, to protect them from predators. Okay, now teachers have been known to be predators to children. Okay, uh, but not even just teachers in the school, but also as kids travel from school to home in the mornings and in the, in the afternoons. Hey guys, look, there are predators watching the schools trying to find opportunities where they can take a child and have their way with them, okay? I'll I never forget, I was in year seven in a, a, my public high school, and I was walking home from school with a friend of mine, and as I got to my road, there was a four-wheel drive just following us. I didn't notice it for a while, but as we sort of walked, the, it would drive up and then stop. We'd walk some more, it would drive up and stop. It, it was just following us. And uh, my friend lived on the other side of the road, into like an apartment complex, and I thought, oh man, what am I going to do? And so we were, we were on his side, so I went with him, but I was trailing behind him, he went to his house, I didn't know where he lived. And now I'm kind of panicking, like I'm, I'm alone, I don't know what to do, right? So um, I go back to the footpath, I start walking to my house, the, the car starts following me again, and then I'm like, I'm just going to run for it. <laughs> and I just ran, I just sprinted to the other side of the street, went to, into our uh, flats, and, and I hid behind went to the, uh, behind my father's car. But as I ran, the doors opened up 
and I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was a man and woman, and they're like, hey, get that effing kid. Grab that effing kid. And they went sprinting after me. Thank God I was fast enough. I was able to hide, and they didn't get me. I, I don't know what they wanted with me. Who knows, right? Who knows? All I'm saying to you guys is there are predators watching the schools. There are predators watching children walk home. This is the second reason why I homeschool my kids. Number three, to provide a biblical foundation to their education. Hey, it's great to learn about math and English and grammar. Hey, and, and grammar and English is really important, guys. Don't underestimate that. Because if you want them to know this word as best as possible, hey, English and grammar is going to help them to be able to understand the teaching here. But hey, whatever we teach them, even if it may not seem biblical, I want to try to have a biblical foundation to it. Okay? Why mathematics? You might say, well, why is that? How's that biblical? Well, you know, God has order. God has laws. You know, uh, one plus one is two. It's never three. All right. In God's eyes, sin is always sin. It's never okay. There's, there's, you know, it's things are black and white. Math is math, black and white. The Bible is black and white. You know, you, you can instill uh, uh, biblical foundations in whatever they're being educated. Number four, to build a stronger family. A stronger family. Hey, we spend more time together. The siblings spend time learning together, uh, in school together. Hey, they're going to develop best friends within themselves. I'd love that. Like, you know, I had some best friends that were not, was not, not my brother. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're living their life. They're in other places of the world. But hey, if I've still got my family, generally speaking, you know, you can still maintain that friendship. There's still some care and love between the family if you can build a strong family network, a strong family relationship. Number five, they get more time. Okay, because instead of wasting their time traveling to school, instead of wasting time between being taught and being educated, instead of wasting time learning about evolution when the school itself doesn't want to teach it, all right, they can finish their studies earlier. And they can pursue their own interests. They can do their own hobbies. Hey, if they want to do extra study, they can do extra study. If they want to go and play, they can play. Right? They've done the work. They've got free time. And they can be children. Okay, they can be children. Uh, number five, or number six, I should say, they've got the comfort of learning at their own pace. At their own pace. Hey, if, they, if they're fast and they want to speed up and be a couple of grades ahead, they can do that if it's easy enough. And if they fall a little behind, hey, they don't have to be afraid that the rest of the class has moved on. Okay? They can go back and revisit that same chapter. They can go back and revisit the videos or whatever complimentary material you have, and they don't have to feel like they're being left behind. And number seven, this is my favorite one. Number seven, life does not revolve around school holidays. All right? Life does not revolve around school holidays. We can go on holidays whenever we want. You know, last year we went to Chile for three months. You think I'd be able to do that if I put my kids in school and take them away for three months? You know, we could have stayed longer if we wanted to, you know? Um, the other advantage is, on school holidays, everything's so expensive, <laughs> right? Accommodation goes up, prices go up everywhere, but when it's not school holidays, it's cheaper. And then that's when we go on school holidays because, you know, our dollar, you know, you get more bang for your buck, you know? So um, these are seven reasons why, uh, you know, we homeschool. And um, yeah, it gets difficult sometimes, for sure. It gets challenging sometimes. But do I really want to roll the dice with my kids? Do I really want to risk that? You know, and look, here's the other thing. Even the school system wants to homeschool your kids. I mean, don't they send homework? <laughs> What's homework? <laughs> right? You just spend six hours at school and your teacher still wants you to do more, more hours at home, right? And it's like, you know, the parent, you know, parents are generally like, oh, did you, get home, did you get homework? Yes or no? Have you finished your homework? That's as far as the involvement parents go when it comes to school. Look, the couple of hours they're doing homework, they probably, if they were just doing homeschooling, they probably would have done more. They would have got that, that work done. And they had the six hours instead of school to pursue their own interests and do their own thing. Okay, so even the school systems know homeschooling works because they give them extra homework to reinforce the things that they were supposed to have, have learned uh, during that time. So guys, um, that's what I've got for you. Obviously, I could go through so many aspects of homeschooling, but I just want to reinforce the fact that God has given you the responsibility. Dads, we're accountable for our kids' education, and don't let anyone take that away from you. Let's pray.